All right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon again. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. D.A. Graham. I am the Interim Vice Provost for Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging here at the University of Kansas. And I am grateful uh, to partner with the KU Law School uh, and uh, Dean Stephen Mazza and his staff and the faculty and uh, lawyers, uh, I'm, I'm guessing graduates of the KU Law School uh, in this space. Um, so we'll give them an opportunity to introduce themselves, uh, but I just want to uh, first welcome you all to this space and, and to this panel on legal and social justice implications surrounding the murder of George Floyd. Uh, we know that this trial uh, the murders of George Floyd, Dante Wright, uh, um, Makia Bryant, uh, and so many others affect members of our community. Uh, while these are national events, our individual perspectives, backgrounds, uh, and experiences inform the way we reach or react to these events. And oftentimes, we do not react uh, in the same manner. Having devoted much of my professional life to social justice uh, and to the ideal of uh, the rule of law uh, in, in my own way, uh, I find the verdict uh, in the killing of George Floyd by uh, former officer Derek Chauvin to be both heartening and depressing. Justice has been met in this case, but uh, it cannot erase the decades and centuries of injustice to Black people. Uh, our collective awareness of this harsh and continuing reality seems sadly shocking uh, to ebb uh, and flow. Uh, if we learn anything from the civil rights movement centered around uh, the Supreme Court's unanimous decision in Brown versus Board of Education, it is that the persistent and painstaking efforts while being will bring true and comprehensive justice. Um, we have waited for the legal judgments before, but none have been more important than uh, the decision that happened on Tuesday or yesterday. Um, I'm losing track of time now. Uh, in uh, the state court of, in, in Minnesota. So it is an opportunity for us uh, to recommit ourselves to removing the practices of discrimination against uh, Black Americans in this country. And with that in mind, uh, I want to turn it over to our moderator, uh, Professor Jung, and he will take it from there. Thank you, Vice Provost uh, Graham. This was, uh, I, I'm very happy that we're having this discussion and this important moment uh, in our history. Uh, when George Floyd uh, was murdered uh, on video, the whole world saw it and it led to um, a, you know, outcry of uh, anger and rage. And uh, Tuesday's verdict does not represent closure uh, to that. It is a step in what is surely a very long road uh, for changing uh, the way that police interact with civilians and in particular uh, minority communities and African-Americans uh, throughout the United States. And I really, I mean, we put this event together uh, and I'm very thankful to our panelists who I will briefly introduce uh, in a minute. Uh, for joining this. I'm also very thankful for all of you who showed up. Uh, we were, uh, I have to say, a little shocked about how many people wanted to, you know, see and be part of uh, this discussion. We've already received dozens of questions. Um, I've tried to put them together in a way that makes sure the panel will have a chance to discuss them and, you know, group them together. Um, but we also are still taking more questions, and I will do my best to filter through those and ensure that we are able to have a, a discussion uh, that meets uh, what you, you, the needs, I guess, of uh, the audience here and what you all are interested in. 
Um, you know, the panel we put together here represents uh, people who have a uh, strong connection to criminal justice and policing and reflects the belief that um, this is, uh, you know, an issue that is important no matter what side of uh, the sort of adversarial legal system that we have, whether you work for the government, the defense, whether you're you know, trapped in the ivory tower as some of uh, people think the professors are, or you are in charge of a city as a mayor, each person um, has reasons to worry about uh, the types of events that uh, were represented by Derek Chauvin's actions of kneeling on George Floyd's neck for over 40, uh, for nine, over nine minutes, sorry. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's something that uh, I don't think many of us will forget. I was also, um, you know, in reviewing the questions that we received, it showed that people are still thinking about Rodney King and all the other victims that have been through the decades and remembering their names and saying that Black Lives Matter, but they're also worried about the future, right? What happens next? And you know, one thing, the, the most common question we received, I just wanna address at a very basic level first, and then our panelists will surely expand upon aspects of it uh, when we get to other issues, which is what, what's the precedent? What does this all mean from a legal perspective? It's established. And the answer from a wholly legal perspective is there, there is no precedent set by this. There, a, a jury verdict, doesn't render anything that's citable in a future case. It doesn't dictate any policy changes or reforms. Um, it's possible that there will be appeals of issues and those might set some limited precedents on question of laws. But there is still importance, right? Not legal precedent is not the um, extent of how a case like this can matter. And I'm, I'm hopeful, and I think our panelists are hopeful uh, that this uh, does send a signal um, because this is, unprecedented in a very real sense. Minnesota has never held police officers in its entire history accountable for murdering civilians. This is itself uh, an outlier event. And across the country, this we've seen this happen over and over and over where it's remarkable even when a police officer is charged, much less convicted. But I don't wanna talk anymore. We need to uh, talk, get to our panelists here. So let me briefly introduce each of them. As somebody whose name is at the end of the alphabet, I'm going to go in reverse alphabetical order here. Uh, so Jean Phillips is a clinical professor of law at KU and director for the Project for Innocence and Post-Conviction Remedies. Um, Brad Finkeldice, the mayor of Lawrence, uh, which is, and, and also on the city commission, right? I think I have that right. Um, and then uh, Sharon Brett is the legal director at the ACLU of Kansas and an adjunct professor at KU. And Mark Bennett is the district attorney of Sedgwick County here in Kansas. And so now that I've you know, talked a little bit about the case, I wanna to get to the first big area of questions uh, that was, was posed through people who um, you know, sent them in before we even started here today. Uh, they concerned the trial itself and the possibility of appeal. Uh, so one question was your comments on, what are your comments on the conduct presented by members of the defense prosecution and the adjudicator in and out of the courtroom? Uh, second question was, are appeals something we need to worry about? What is the appeals process for the kinds of charges uh, that Chauvin was convicted on? Uh, were there any obvious defects in the trial that could lead to a successful appeal? So I, I open it up uh, to uh, the panel here. Uh, what, what did you all think in terms of the trial and the possibility of appeal, um, what issues would be raised on appeal and what any likely outcome is. Well, I guess I can start. Um, so as uh, spending most of my life as an appellate defense attorney, there will be an appeal. There's always an appeal. Um, you will always look for issues. The strength of those issues varies, but there is always an appeal. Um, so there are a few that sort of jumped out at me um, just based on um, my knowledge of the case, which I admit I didn't watch it from beginning to end. Um, I anticipate there will be some issues that will have a constitutional component in terms of like the US constitutional component and due process and fair trial. And some of them will probably be more limited to Minnesota statutory law. 
Um, I think that they will probably most certainly appeal the failure to change venue, which means that it sh the trial should have been held somewhere else where um, you, the theory is that you don't get a fair trial when the, the members of your community are so saturated with media and with the high emotions that were running in that area that I anticipate they will probably say that we should have had the trial in a different location. Um, I, I anticipate that there may be an issue about the failure to sequester the jurors all through the trial because jurors were not, sequestering means that they are not allowed to go home, that they are kept in a location, a hotel where they're restricted in terms of being able to read papers or see news. Um, there may be an issue there. Um, I, I, after that, there, I'm not entirely sure that I know enough about all of the um, challenges that could be made to, um, to the Minnesota statutes or law, but I was looking at a couple of other places um, that said that, you know, there may be some issues that would come down from um, the Minnesota Supreme Court is whether or not murder three is proper under the facts of this case and whether or not there was any kind of misconduct by the prosecutor for belittling defense attorney and closing argument. So, I mean, there may be some issues that are going to be appealed. Whether they're successful or not, that's a different story, but I'm sure there will be appeals. Uh, from the prosecutor's perspective, um, you know, the, the question is always on a, on a high profile case, whether there's a, should have been a change of venue. The remedy for that, though, is adequate voir dire, the jury selection process, and the, I didn't, again, I, all of us have day jobs, so I'm sure we weren't sitting there from nine to five every day, but the, the gist I got from the uh, you know, postscript each day and each morning was that I think they had two, two weeks voir dire or something like that. I mean, they had full and effective cross or a right to question the panel and um, felt like they got a, a good cross section of the community. So that's always raised, but the truth is it's rarely um, a basis, a viable basis for an, a, overturning a case as long as, I mean, the, the, the seminal case was the uh, uh, the Cleveland back in the 50s. I'm blanking on the guy's name now. The It was the genesis of the, uh, what was it, their Harrison Ford movie, The One-Armed Man and all that. It was uh, Dr. Shepard. Shepard, yeah. And uh, at any rate, you know, that was kind of a, a disaster. But that set the bar fairly high, frankly, in terms of how bad something has to be to have an effective uh, change of venue. So at any rate, um, the I would say under Kansas law, we kind of had a we were laughing around here going, man, they can get away with a lot in Minnesota. You could not under Kansas law in terms of all the questions about, you know, how does this make you feel today? I mean, that's an appeal to passion under Kansas law and absolutely get your case overturned. But, you know, these are there wasn't an objection from the defense. And I understand by reputation, he's a 20 plus year uh, experienced defense attorney with good reputation up there. And you know, if he didn't, if he thought it was objectionable under Minnesota law, I have no doubt he would have objected and the, or the judge would have shut him down. But so there are things that are peculiar to Minnesota, what they allow to happen that we wouldn't. Um, but I don't think that's going to be a basis for an appeal. I mean, if it was, it's the, the kind of thing that you would have thought a judge would have shut down right off the bat. Final thing is, again, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I'd like to talk to somebody from Minnesota. How is it you can be, I get being convicted of three counts. Um, you can be convicted of multiple counts, but in, under Kansas law, you couldn't be sentenced under the only thing. You committed one murder, not three. Um, and so while a jury can find someone guilty of multiple counts, a judge tip in under Kansas law would only be able to sentence under under one. Although it sounds like from the pundits I've heard describing it that he faces sentencing on all three. So I don't know if that's an appeal issue. If that's what Minnesota law allows, then, then, then it wouldn't be. So those are just some quick observations. Yeah, let me just I, I help a little bit for the, the non-lawyers in our audience there. Um, the lack of an objection by the defense during the trial um, is changes the status uh, and the standard that's used for appeal. Um, so, you know, we tend to focus on the issues where there was an objection and the judge denied it, um, because otherwise you're looking at a type of claim that that's not even usually the core of a direct appeal, which is saying your counsel was ineffective and didn't represent you well. And that's a, a much harder claim to make. 
And as DA Bennett was saying, this is a very experienced defense lawyer. And so I, I wanna highlight, there's been several questions poured in already related to this. And um, there was an objection made about, um, for example, Ma Representative Maxine Waters comments during uh, the trial. And that was before the jury was sequestered. Uh, so when, by the time Biden said something, which was pretty benign, but it's still some people were, were upset about it. The jury was, was then isolated. Um, but I agree strongly with, with the Avenue here that these claims are made frequently and almost never ever won. And that's what Wadair, we, we have our different pronunciations here. Um, you hear it said in a lot of different ways, but jury selection uh, for the non-lawyers. Um, and that process went relatively smoothly. We didn't have any known problems among the jurors. And so, um, yeah, I think I just wanted to address the Representative Waters thing on point. And so, yes, there will always be appeals. It's a right of a defendant uh, in our criminal justice system to get a direct appeal. Um, I am skeptical of any of the arguments I've seen being winnable, but there will be media coverage. There will be a process. And then I did want to address at least one minor thing here, which is the double jeopardy three charges thing. Um, I understand Minnesota, he will only be sentenced on the basis of the highest charge, but they go through the process of the other charges. So if there is an appeal that removes the highest charge, everything's already in place for the, what are called the lesser included offenses. And it, states do this all differently. And so Kansas, I think is the more majority approach. And some people are a little confused about what's going on in Minnesota, but yes, it's the second degree murder charge. Uh, Professor Phillips, you wanted to add anything else there? No, I was just going to say um, that you have to remember that each individual state has its own statutes and its own rules and that, that Minnesota is a little different than Kansas. They allow in character evidence. They allow in evidence about um, developing the humanity of the victim and how how the um, impact of the loss makes the individuals feel. And that's something that we would not allow in Kansas. And they do allow that in Minnesota. And, and then just to, um, uh, you, you actually already mentioned it, Corey, that in Minnesota, they instruct on all possible crimes of which you could be convicted. And then they just sentence you on the highest level crime. Or in Kansas, we wouldn't do that. You would have to decide if you met one crime, then that's what you're convicted of. And if not, then you would move down to the lesser offense and then down to the manslaughter offense. And they do that differently. And, and so you just have to pay attention to um, and understand that each state deals with those issues differently. And maybe this is a good transition point for um, Professor Hiltz for us to talk a little bit about sentencing because this is, we've started to touch on it. And this was another question, which is what is the likely sentence in this case? And well, so I'll start off by just saying that, you know, Minnesota, like most states, has a guideline system, um, which is not mandatory, but it sets a structure within the statutory range, whatever the maximum or minimum is set. It recommends, and that's usually the starting point for any sentencing. And so you'll hear the media talk a lot about he could face up to 40 years in prison. That, that's the maximum. That's what the media tends to focus on. Um, the guidelines here starts with an eight-year recommendation for a first-time offender for second degree. But I think Professor Phillips is a little more information uh, relevant to the questions, like what factors the prosecutors think should enhance that sentence. Yeah, so um, in this case, a murder to um, conviction, which is what the highest level offense he was convicted of, based on a zero criminal history, puts him in what we call a, a grid box or a, a number of months, which this individual could potentially be sentenced to. And um, from all of the information that I've received from the colleagues of mine in Minnesota, he's looking at 128 to 180 months. Under Minnesota law, which Kansas has a similar law, you have the ability to establish that the crime was committed in a particularly heinous manner, such that you can depart upward from that. And you can depart upward, as you said, Professor Young, up to um, the maximum of 40. Uh, my understanding is that they are limited by basically doubling the sentence. So if you doubled that 128 to 180 months, he'd be looking at a maximum of 360. And there were um, although those factors, those aggravating factors, um, uh, there are a number of them if you look at the statute. There are some that the prosecution has already asked Judge Cahill to evaluate, 
and there are that the crime was committed with three or more active co-participants and that's assuming that the other right that's based on the the charging of the other three officers that it was committed in the presence of children or children witnessed the crime the defendant acted as a police officer and used his police license to facilitate the crime that he displayed particular cruelty and here the prosecution is arguing that he knew the victim was handcuffed and in physical and emotional distress uh, the prosecution is arguing that he was unable to breathe and went unconscious and the defendant should have known um, at that time that there was a problem he committed the crime despite pleas for uh, from the people around him the eyewitnesses to stop um, he continued after the person went unconscious he had disregard for floyd's life and he impeded medical assistance right so the prosecution has already got a whole list of things that meet those factors um, and um, if you uh, paid attention to the trial, you know that the defense attorney waived um, the um, part of the aggravating factors uh, procedure, which is that normally those aggravating factors have to be found by a jury, and they waived that so that the judge can make the decision about those aggravating factors and whether or not they justify a higher sentence. Thank you. I mean, that's a, a, a lot more than I think you'll hear in the, the, from the pundits on TV. And I know some of this is really getting into legal weeds here. Uh, we are going to step back and talk more about, you know, still we have a panel of lawyers here, uh, but talk about some of the, the bigger picture things. Uh, but we're just trying to make sure that there was a lot of questions, I think, from uh, alums, from, from students that wanted to know what exactly is, is likely here, what's going to happen. And I think there's reasons, you know, don't focus on the 40 year number. Um, and, and in case you're not in the criminal justice system and not used to dividing months by 12, what we're talking that 15 year range was coming up a lot. Um, for me, I, I can divide any number by 12, I think, after years of, of doing this. Um, so yeah, that's the, 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 the area that we could be looking at. There's several aggravating factors which seem, you know, ironclad and some, you know, the cruelty one is always uh, gonna be a, a discretionary matter, in this case for the judge and not the jury. Um, so that's, I think, our, our sentencing picture. Uh, let, let's, do, you know, transition now away from just this trial and appeal to one of the, the big things, you know, that, that was on the, the mind of so many people and still is, which is, what is this going to mean in terms of um, spurring further reform and uh, change, uh, either uh, through the legislatures uh, at the state level, at the federal level, um, through administrative action, again, state, uh, federal, but also local uh, police, uh, sometimes, uh, um, you know, initiated by uh, the executive branch, mayors, uh, sometimes the police have more autonomy. So there's a lot of different um, uh, parties and stakeholders that can be involved in these reform efforts. And, um, and it's also sometimes prodded by uh, entities like the ACLU, uh, which through the courts um, can sometimes, and oftentimes I should say, uh, get things moving quicker. So maybe uh, we can turn here first to um, uh, Professor Brett and ask, uh, what do you think in terms of this, this case, this outcome, uh, will it you know, give more uh, uh, force uh, and, and increase the probability of success in these efforts? If so, what, what do you see possibly happening in the, the future? Sure, so, you know, I guess I would start by saying that as a civil rights attorney, I don't look at criminal convictions as the sort of change agent for the system, right? It's an individual criminal conviction. Um, it certainly can bring some measure of accountability. Um, and I think in so many cases where those convictions don't happen, um, predominantly when it's a white police officer killing a black man or a black woman, um, that conviction can mean a lot um, as a measure of accountability, but criminal convictions are not sort of the sources or the agents for change of the system as a whole. Um, and so I think that you know, when we look to what's going to actually change the system, what's going to change the institution of policing so that the next death of a Black man doesn't happen at the hands of law enforcement, um, we have to think at something much bigger than individual criminal convictions. And, and so I think legislative reforms are a step in that direction. Um, I think the legislative reforms that get kicked around most often now are things like abolishing qualified immunity. Um, but I think it's actually even more granular than that. I think what, what we're seeing through 
all of the different cases that that come out and and you know what was on full display with Dante Wright's death as well um, is that there's a lot of work that law enforcement does that puts them in these interactions, um, particularly with the black community that turn deadly, that turn violent um, very quickly. Um, and so, you know, from a, the perspective of somebody who litigates these cases, you know, the legislative reform is getting law enforcement out of the business of having to do all of this very low level street enforcement stuff that puts them in these interactions um, with black community members that end up with black community members dead. Um, I think one of the things we wanna look to here, so there was already a civil lawsuit filed on behalf of George Floyd's family that resulted in a large settlement, a large monetary amount. Um, but what we're looking to now is the sort of next iteration. The DOJ just announced that it's going to do a pattern and practice investigation of the Minneapolis Police Department um, and look at whether there has been a pattern or practice of uh, constitutional violations that have occurred within that department. Um, and so the result that could come out of that investigation is perhaps like a, a whole list of, of reforms that the uh, department has to engage in to try to move itself towards constitutional policing. Uh, but even that might not be the answer, right? So the, the fact is that the Fourth Amendment gives law enforcement pretty wide latitude to engage in a lot of conduct that could set up these types of interactions. And so just getting a consent decree in place that allows for constitutional policing um, may not be enough in and of itself. Um, so I think the, the changes happen at a local level. They happen as a result of organizers demanding change. Um, they happen um, with mayors that are willing to lead progressive causes and really implement culture change throughout the executive branch, which often includes uh, the chief of police. Um, so I think that these things have to happen at a much more granular level. I think litigation, like the, the type of litigation that I do at the ACLU and that I've done previously, you know, can shine a light on the problem and can shine a light on potential solutions on a more systemic level than individual criminal prosecutions of officers. But I think the real solutions come from organizers um, and from the community uh, at the most granular level. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a very helpful. I wanna, again, just for the, not just the non-lawyers, but also people who don't specialize in, in criminal law and the law students, just add a little more information there. So uh, talking about these um, investigations that's been initiated by the DOJ that can result in what we call a consent decree. Uh, this has been a, a long used practice. I know Professor Brett was involved in um, them before uh, coming to Kansas. Um, where the DOJ does really, I mean, do an incredible uh, amount of investigation uh, into a department. Uh, then they create a, a big report that is quite voluminous. You might have um, seen one or at least seen one talked about after um, Darren Wilson had uh, shot and killed Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, uh, that one of these investigations was done. The report was, was incredibly, um, enlightening and, and horrifying. Um, it, it detailed uh, so many different ways that that uh, police department was deficient. This practice was ended uh, of doing these consent decrees. I mean, it had been long used as, a, as the major vehicle for the federal government to be involved in uh, helping to limit um, uh, police misconduct uh, by the Trump administration. Uh, Jeff Sessions was never a fan of this. They got rid of it very early um, in the administration. And so for several years now, we've had police departments where there might be genuine rot to the core. There might be clear evidence that, that things need to be looked at, and that's not been possible. Um, but now, thankfully, it is again. So that's one mechanism there. We'll talk a little bit more about qualified immunity in, in a minute. Uh, but I wanted to give our, our last panelist a, a, a chance to, to join us here. Uh, but I feel a little, little um, in an odd position here because after all, this is my mayor and I would like to see um, some, some reforms done and I wanna see better policing practices. So I am gonna put him a little bit in the spot as a constituent, but also as a moderator here, which is uh, what do you think uh, we need to do here in Lawrence and what, do you, what are you going to be supporting going forward uh, to try and try and prevent uh, abuse in our by our police department, um, you know, after the, the guilty verdict in the Chauvin trial? Yes, thanks. You know, I am I am a KU law grad in 99 
Um, but I don't do criminal law, so I'm glad you didn't ask me any sort of criminal questions. So that's it's good. But, um, you know, as Professor Brett said, I think there's, there's two lines going on here, and both of them are active in, in Lawrence. Um, one is the question of police interactions. And, um, you know, we are heading down the track of, you know, looking at ways to reduce police interactions, interactions with the homeless, replacing that with a homeless outreach team, interactions with mental health. We have a small mental health team, but looking to expand that. We're, we're looking at some domestic violence interventions. Um, you know, some of those require police presence because of the violence going on, but you know, in ways we can reduce that. Um, in particular, the recidivism of going back to the same house over and over, again, reducing the um, presence there. And then for things like code enforcement and parking, parking is already out here in Lawrence, but in some of those other areas, all the ways we can reduce um, that interaction through better, frankly, better means. And, and when I talk to our police officers here in Lawrence, I can tell you none of them got into the profession of being a police officer, you know, to interact with homeless people in downtown Lawrence. I mean, that's not what they want to be doing. Um, and so um, we've got, uh, I think, strong support from within the police um, in and of itself um, to reduce some of those interactions. You know, the second part of that was, um, you know, the culture of the police department. And actually before, um, even the George Floyd incident, we had hired a consultant to, to do a um, complete review of our police department as we looked to the next police chief to tell us what do we need to ha have in a police chief. That process was started. Um, you know, the, the, the George Floyd incident happened and we obviously expanded that scope some, appropriately so. Um, and that report is actually gonna be coming out next month or maybe the 1st of June. And that is, we've been working with an interim police chief, um, and we're going to look at and set up a profile of what kind of chief we want, and then go out and hire that chief. And part of that is to look at the culture and look at um, how the police force works. And so we're going to try to address that on both ends. Thank you. And I, I, I you know, return, you connected with the, one of the points here that Professor Brett mentioned, which is, that so much of the problem, so many of the problems we have here arise just from the fact that the way the US polices uh, creates interactions. And those interactions with uh, minority committees um, are more frequent because of the way policing is directed. Uh, the homelessness issue and mental illness is also something that doesn't get talked about, whereas uh, people that are killed by police, you know, uh, homeless and mentally ill populations are disproportionately represented uh, as well. And I, traffic stops is something that, you know, this country, if, until you, you live abroad for any length of time, I don't think you, you might appreciate how much our policing is focused on traffic stops. Um, and the drug war was a big part of that. And, you know, one of the reasons why, if not the primary reasons that police enforce on highways and roads as much as they do is to then search cars, which has been, you know, very um, made to be a very permissive process uh, by the U.S. Supreme Court, whereas you get other countries, and if you see a cop on the road, it, it, they're probably helping somebody who's got a flat tire. Um, there's just not the same emphasis. Uh, there's much more foot patrol, you know, and so the, the types of interactions we have here shape um, the, the ultimate violence that can sometimes ensue, and replacing policing, I've seen in several questions already with other alternatives like mental health professionals. Somebody mentioned Denver in the questions. Um, I know Berkeley, uh, it was uh, very early in that. Uh, and it's good to see Lawrence, you know, recognizing that police are not the only um, uh, agent of the government uh, that can be involved here and they're ill-fitted for it. Um, and we shouldn't think just because we have a police hammer that everything is a nail. And I think that's been the common uh, perspective of governments across uh, the country. Um, I will also add one other thing, just is that I know, you know, there's, there's a lot of different views and, and entities here, but my work on the, the state level and committees, I've at least found our police union to be far more willing to engage in reform uh, than some other uh, uh, states and cities I've worked with. And I'm hopeful uh, that here in Kansas, we'll have less resistance on that front. Uh, because I think we do need to see uh, some changes. 
And, um, you know, they've been much more willing, for example, to turn over body cam footage. I helped work on the, the law uh, or the, the recommended law to, to make that a, a quick, easy process. I mean, they, they've just not resisted in the same way. So that's at least gives me uh, some cause for optimism. I want to return to uh, uh, either DA Bennett or uh, Professor Phillips. Do you all have thoughts here on legislative reform? If there's things that you think you know, should be prioritized maybe here, that would be uh, helpful because there's so many different possibilities and so many different things going on at the federal and state level. So e either one of you want to jump in. I'd say there's a couple of things that you brought up that I'll just weigh in on that uh, the notion of FOPs and the, the role they play. I just, I have a file on, on um, these kind of issues I've kept over the years and I found something last night when I got the call, we we're going to do this. It's an article from the, um, Minneapolis Star Tribune from October 1st of 2017. So well before any of this took place and it was uh, editorial that hundreds of sworn officers in Minnesota, uh, despite the fact they've had convictions uh, for cr crimes, uh, maintain their um, their jobs. And I had seen something and I, and I don't want to, you know, trials are worth, I don't want to attribute this if it's false, but I understood early on in this I we'll say the Times, New York Times put this out, maybe it was the po Washington Post, but that Chauvin himself had been disciplined any number of times, like 16, 17 times. And the strength of that FOP um, precluded the chief from, you know, taking any substantive administrative action against him. And so I know that that is something when you talk to quietly in law enforcement circles, when a chief of police fires somebody because he doesn't believe that individual deserves to wear the same badge that, that you know, the other people do, and they grieve and they go to an arbitrator and they get the job back, it puts the police chief in one hell of a position. Um, and so I think when you're talking about uh, reform issues, um, to me, that would be a place to, to, to start. You gotta be careful because there's a whole lot of unions um, that have nothing to do with law enforcement that it's hard to, to, to attack that issue with a scalpel. It's, uh, if you say you can't do certain things with respect to unions in the context of a criminal justice system are you saying the same thing in terms of in, with respect to the afl cio and you know others no but um that is something i think i've heard enough about of late that i think that'll be on the topic or on the table rather of, of discussions nationally the notion of traffic stops seems very mundane to people but you mentioned the the brown uh the michael brown inspired um, consent decree out of ferguson if you read that document and it's lengthy but it's it's very much focused on the um, over policing of traffic offenses. It wasn't, they didn't find, at least I don't remember reading, you know, re re situations replete with, uh, you know, SWAT teams kicking down doors and shooting people, but it was just the day to day habitual pulling people over. You know, there's 30, 30, 50, 35,000, 40,000 people live in that town and they issued over the course of a few years enough traffic tickets to give every man, woman, and child in the entire jurisdiction. A traffic ticket and and that was one of the things they found and that leads to um feelings of harassment and and then and that many more hell is just that many more opportunities for something to go wrong when there's that many traffic uh, infractions being tickets being issued and cars being pulled over and so you mentioned earlier that it's the way we've come to police and there, there's an element of truth to that but you're also i think missing one other part of that is it's the way we police because it's the way we as a society have chosen to do nothing else meaning we don't put any money, uh, not in Kansas, not in the United States, into um, any other sort of street level so societal or social um, programs. I mean, if somebody calls and says, my uncle is, um, you know, out of his head, whether it's because of, you know, mental issues, drugs, whatever, there is no team of, of clinicians that are going to go respond to the house. I mean, cops and they're gonna show up and the odds of it going well are, are poor. Um, you know, you talk about the high incidence of, at least proportionally of, of African-Americans having uh, uh, outcomes with law enforcement where law, where law enforcement shoots and kills African-Americans. And, and obviously that's the topic of the day, but there is another subcategory that includes African-Americans that is the mentally ill. Um, of all the cases I've handled in involving officer involved shootings, I, I can think of one that did not involve mental illness and the fact that we have cops with guns and badges going out interacting with people who are mentally ill. Yes, that's an issue of policing, but it's also an issue of, of the fact that our policymakers, not just now, but over the course of the history of this country, 
chose to give that job to cops instead of outfitting other uh, another entity that would be better equipped to handle that. And when you've seen small efforts, uh, Wichita's got one, Topeka's got one, where we co-locate um, social workers with cops to go respond to those things, and the cops hold back and stay back and let the social workers lead. Uh, the outcomes are much better, and um, it's just a, a matter, frankly, of the institutional will to pay for these sort of things. And I, again, I'm not singling anyone out. This is something that goes beyond all jurisdictions. It's a nationwide issue, and um, so I, I agree with you. Those are the those are two topics that, you know, what what could you do substantively? You know, we talk about reducing racism, and those are very amorphous, uh, ethereal things, hard to judge, but reducing the number of car stops on a given day is not an ethereal thing. That makes a, that is a, a substantive, tangible difference in, in the lives of the cops and of the people they police. Yeah, I think those are really good points. Uh, just in case people weren't sure, uh, FOP is the Fraternal Order of Police, uh, which is the, right. the police union. Um, I know sometimes we, we use terms and, and abbreviations that um, not all everyone knows here. Uh, we'll turn to Professor Phillips in a second, but I want to give Professor Brett a chance to, to chime in here uh, regarding uh, the police union issue. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would just say two quick things in response to DA Bennett, because I think those were really, really strong points. So I think um, just quickly on the on the mental health piece, I think we need to be thinking about the ways in, we, in, in which we use police to respond to those types of, of incidents, but just the ways in which we use police within the branches of the city government writ large. And, and you brought up Ferguson, and the important thing to remember about the Ferguson investigation and the findings from DOJ is that the police were doing what they did because the city government wasn't adequately funding the police department and the courts. And so they were policing in this way to drum up revenue through fines and fees to adequately fund government functions. And so when we let legislators off the hook for failing to adequately fund government functions, it puts the police in this position of being revenue collectors, which then adds to that um, cycle of violence as well. So I think that was worth mentioning. And the second thing I just want to uplift about um, what DA Bennett said is that you know, when we think about police accountability, when I have done police misconduct litigation um, at DOJ and, and thinking about it too from the lens of the ACLU, one of the biggest barriers to accountability are these collective bargaining agreements with unions that have a tremendous number of protections for officers in there um, that allow officers to stay on the force despite really long histories of misconduct um, and that actually protect officers in many different ways during internal investigations into misconduct um, so that they don't end up with a disciplinary history even if they've been involved in a number of problematic incidents. So those CBAs are things that at the legislative level and at the city level too when those contracts are negotiated, those are things that politicians have a tremendous amount of, of discretion into and that can go a long way in actually um, keeping misconduct um, and people who commit misconduct from happening and from remaining on the floor. So I just wanted to add that in. Yeah, and some of the, I see in the question queue, some people have asked specifically about, and, and I think uh, DA Bennett Mitch, uh, mentioned Chauvin's uh, record here, right? He has allegations of misconduct. Um, and will those matter in sentencing? Well, they don't count in the same way that, you know, a convicted prior crime would, that then he wouldn't be a first time offender. Um, I'm actually not sure what Minnesota's rule is about what's called relevant conduct at the federal level and in other state terms, which is, do you get to look at these sort of background factors? But I, I see Professor Phillips is shaking her head no, so I'm guessing that they're probably not going to factor in things. Um, but I think she's also going to talk to us a little bit about uh, some other reform efforts, and I at least want to give a brief definition of qualified immunity for those of you who don't know what it is. Um, it's a uh, civil doctrine. Uh, which was invented whole, out of whole cloth, you know, just came from nowhere from the court, uh, where uh, they decided that if uh, an officer committed a constitutional wrong as an, an individual, um, and, you know, and we're talking about state police here, and there's a lawsuit under what's called Section 1983, the primary means of effectuating civil rights uh, under federal law, um, that a officer uh, receives qualified immunity as long as it wasn't uh, clearly established at the time of, of their misconduct that they were violating the law. And this, this is something that now there's strong bipartisan uh, criticism of. Uh, the, the libertarian wing of the GOP, the Cato Institute have come out in support, citing that many liberals and, 
and um, people on the defense side have been saying for years, which is this is this is a rule that doesn't exist in any other context. Why are police media? So one of the reform efforts, and I know there's several questions about it, is is either eliminating qualified immunity or uh, which I would favor, uh, but uh, there's also efforts to at least uh, make it less of a shield because it really does protect officers from civil liability. Uh, and, and I should also be clear, some people worry, you know, well, have suing police directly, doesn't that beg our them? No, police are always indemnified. Um, it's one of the things that's often lost in this. So it's not like we're, we're suing officers into bankruptcy. It's uh, their insurance rates will go up as police departments, which is maybe appropriate if they have a lot of problems there. But let's turn to Professor um, Phillips and uh, about other report efforts and ideas that you want to, to touch on. So I'm just going to sort of build upon what uh, DA Bennett and Professor Brett talked about. There actually are, I was looking um, at, I have not done a 50 state survey, right, because each individual state passes their own legislation and within each state you have, as we do in Lawrence, you have your local police departments. But I do know um, that there are a number of police departments across the nation that are starting to add mental health uh, professionals to respond. Um, in Seattle, they had folks respond who were social workers who were very, um, the focus was on dealing with the drug problem that they were having in Seattle. And so those were folks that were um, able to go out and respond to people who may be doing things because they are, you know, high on meth or whatever it happens to be. And so I know that individual police departments are starting to do that. But there are a couple of things that I did discover in looking through some state legislation. And interestingly, Minnesota has legislation pending or introduced um, that would limit the authority of law enforcement to stop individuals for petty misdemeanors. So I have not looked up exactly what petty misdemeanor counts as, but you know, that could be speeding, um, which is interesting. And so one of the other issues that has come up is not that you shouldn't have law enforcement stop someone for speeding, right? Because you can be really dangerous if you're driving hundred miles an hour down a residential street is a dangerous thing, but that there will be different rules for what law enforcement can do. So you can't stop someone for speeding and then start asking them questions and see if you have consent to search their car and then the stop escalates. Um, but I do know that Minnesota is, is trying to limit the ability of law enforcement to stop individuals. Um, the other thing that if I looked through like Washington State, Minnesota, Maryland, and it's even in the policing legislation, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act that is um, circulating now through um, the US Congress is this notion of creating a database that tracks law enforcement officers who have disciplinary complaints filed against them. There's also in Maryland, um, they're starting to put civilians on the disciplinary review boards. So it's not just internal within law enforcement, but that they're bringing in members of the community um, that they are training up folks um, who will participate in that. I don't know how that's going to impact um, when you get to unions and FOP and the protections that is provided by the unions. Um, but I know that they're at least starting to take a crack at that in some fashion. And um, uh, the uh, sort of the other thing I would talk about is that, um, you know, there's also some more limited uh, you know, restricting the ability to use no-knock warrants. If we think about Breonna Taylor, where they, you know, executed a no-knock warrant and killed her, um, that they're changing the subpoena powers of the DOJ so that they can get access to records from various police departments more easily. Um, of course, body cams, dash cams, that's all very popular. Um, I did see that in the federal legislation, they're restricting the transfer of military equipment so that your police departments do not become militarized in the same fashion, right? That's not what they were meant to do. Um, so uh, there's also interestingly um, legislation in Maryland where they one repealed the bill of rights that law enforcement officers have, which I have to tell you, I don't read that bill of rights. I'm not entirely sure what's in that bill of rights, but I found it in interesting that there was such a thing. Um, but they've repealed that and they have created a new use of force policy that um, if you violate that use of force policy and you result that results in injury or death, that is a crime for which law enforcement can be prosecuted and sentenced to up to 10 years in prison. So, um, right, there, there are some things that different folks are trying to do across the country. And of course, it's very piecemeal, um, but there's efforts. Um, my one last comment, and then I'll turn it back over because I feel like I'm talking a lot. 
um, is the the funding of government fun of programs. Um, I will just leave it with this, is that when I worked on the Kansas Criminal Justice Commission with DA Bennett, um, I learned that a lot of our um, court system is funded based upon traffic tickets and based and funded based upon people who can't pay their traffic tickets and then they get their license suspended and then they drive anyway and then they got another ticket and then they have to pay more money to get their license back and they have to pay the court costs and they have to pay the court fines. And that when you try to change that, you get a lot of pushback from uh, from the Office of Judicial Administration because that's the money that pays for court clerks. That's the money that pays for your personnel. And so we're really funding our government kind of backwards here, in my opinion, right? On the backs of poor people. Yeah, I mean, this is the, the phrase criminalizing poverty. If you hear that, this is what it's referring to, this idea that it really punishes people that already don't have money and then it compounds and compounds it. And it is, you know, Ferguson was dependent on this revenue of the big highway that went through the city. Uh, you also have uh, civil forfeiture. Um, you know, the recent statistic, although it's been true for several years now, uh, that the government has taken more in civil forfeiture uh, than through its various police departments than uh, in value. Uh, than all the burglaries in the same year combined. I mean, so we're talking about an enormous amount of money that in our systems become dependent on. And I do want to get to some of this sort of conflict issue, which, you know, is really stymied reform reform, and, and made some people, you know, favor what's often called defunding police, which, you know, is a bit of a misnomer from the way, or it's portrayed wrong, I should say. Um, it doesn't mean necessarily abolishing police. Um, it means that we put way too much money into, uh, say, these massive military vehicles, right? Our, our drawdown authority where they take excess vehicles and sell them to local departments, and not enough on these other things. I think this point's been touched on, but I want to uh, put a question for our DA and mayor on the panel here, which is um, one of the problems that uh, has been asked in a couple of recent questions is, that, uh, for example, DAs work with police all the time. You have, you're dependent on them, and yet if you're being asked to prosecute them, uh, there seems to be a conflict. Uh, similarly, mayors, you know, uh, in support of the police, the police union uh, is an essential part of, of making, being able to implement uh, lots of the things that uh, they want. And so even though this is not a panacea, uh, of, there's, Lots of people suggest, well, this should be handled by the state or other jurisdictions, which is kind of scary if you're you're a mayor or you're a DA that somebody else is going to be handling things in your jurisdiction. It also has always worked, right? Breonna Taylor case went to the state and they didn't even submit any real charge to the grand jury there. So I want to want to see what you two all think in terms of having sort of outsiders at the state or another county. Uh, be involved in handling policing matters? And, and what is your jurisdiction? Um, do you think that helps solve this conflict of interest or, or dynamic? Uh, either one of you who wants to jump in. I'd say there isn't a conflict of interest. I mean, the, the appearance of impropriety applies to judges. It doesn't apply to lawyers. Um, so that gets tossed around a lot and, and misused. The reality is I prosecute cops all the time and no one ever raises a, a concern when it's a domestic violence case or a DUI, or they get in a fight with their neighbor in a you know battery case, we charge cops with rape and you know, a number of other things. And most of the time, it's not when they're on duty, um, and no one ever calls and asks me if I have a conflict of interest handling that. It's only when it's an officer-involved shooting, and the reality is um, the laws are set up the way they are. We could spend an hour talking about the difficulties and why it is that it's so difficult to prosecute somebody. Um, you know, during the period of time I've been the district attorney, I've reviewed 14 or 15 officer involved shootings, and I've not been able to, or fatalities, I should say, not been able to charge any of them. In the same period of time, people say, well, it's, you know, if it was somebody else, you'd have done it, you would have charged them. And in the same period of time, I've not charged 31 civilians um, with shooting people, including 15 African Americans. Uh, who killed people with guns and I didn't charge them on their self-defense as well because we have self-defense immunity in the state of Kansas. Um, applies to cops, applies to citizens. Uh, now, are you, if, if, would it make more sense to give this to the Attorney General's office? Okay, 
I don't mind. I, you know, if the attorney general wants to come in and, and, and involve himself or herself in a case like this, sure. But what are we asking our, you know, what's the reason, what are we really getting here? Because the attorney general doesn't work with cops because the attorney general isn't beholden to, you know, law enforcement as well. I mean, the reality is I would have a conflict of interest based upon uh, individuals. Uh, the sheriff's a good friend of mine. I've known him for 25, 26 years. We've worked together. Um, we talk to each other routinely. If he had shot somebody, I'd have a problem because I know him. Um, the last 10, 15 cases I've reviewed of, of fatalities, I don't know any of these cops. They're kids. Um, the last time I knew the cops on the street was about 1999. Uh, the only guys I know anymore by name are all captains and you know lieutenants and deputy chiefs. Um, and so that they happen to work for a particular department um, is interesting. If, if I felt though that I couldn't because I was somehow beholden to that department or this department, I'd have an obligation to beg off. But um, all you'd have to do is look in the newspaper and find how many times you know I've butted heads with the FOP and know that if, if you can't handle doing this job, if you can't handle the, the notion that you might have to charge a cop occasionally or a city council member uh, or file a motion to um, have somebody kicked off the county commission that you answer to, which I had to do last fall, then don't run for DA. I would jump in, take it a little different direction. And um, two things, one, I would say just locally um, for those who are interested in Lawrence, you know, and again, these are all different in every city, probably in every state. Um, our FOP does not have um, any sort of kind of appeal rights. As a matter of fact, our city manager would fire officers, not the chief of police, it's the city manager. And they, of course they could take you to court for wrongly fire them, but there's no arbitration um, provisions. You know, but one of the issues kind of related to what you were talking about that, that is going on in Lawrence so is this idea of um, citizen review boards. And um, should there be someone else um, looking, you know, a review board that helps citizens looking over um, activities of the police department. And we have um, a citizen review board. Um, it's not, you know, that when it was set up, it was set up only to look at racial issues um, that were appealed and um, they've had no appeals. So they've been actually not reviewed the case. And so now they're looking at expanding their um, scope and that's being talked about right now. Um, there's a draft out being circulated um, and being discussed. And again, in the in the May, June, July timeframe, we'll be looking at setting up a review board so that there's a different path for someone to, um, you know, possibly make a complaint against the police officer as opposed to calling the police to complain about the police. And again, various levels across the country by, by what's meant by a citizen review board and what their powers are. Um, but we're going to be looking at that here in Lawrence. And I think we, we are running out of time here, and I know that um, there's still so much we could talk about, um, but I do want to at least offer, you know, some concluding thoughts and, and thank everyone for being part of this. Um, I think the civilian review boards are a good uh, place to, to end here because this sort of goes back to something Professor Brett mentioned that I'm going to reframe, uh, which is you know, the old environmental slogan of think global, act local. Uh, is incredibly true when it comes to policing. Yes, it would be great if Congress and a federal uh, uh, ruling uh, came down and various things that were top down, but the simple fact is policing is local. And finding places like civilian review boards uh, to be involved, uh, getting involved in local politics, pushing back against police unions are things that we can all do. Um, and it's important. I mean, it's not lost on us today that, that this panel is uh, five white people. Uh, we are not oblivious to this effect. I'm very grateful that we, everyone could be here on short notice, but our community is more diverse than that. And we need to have uh, diverse uh, uh, social efforts uh, in these boards and in these uh, places to make a difference. And I hope that today, um, you know, illustrates that there's a lot of lawyers out there who have very strong beliefs uh, that we need to change radically in this area. And hopefully, you know, the awful uh, um, murder of George Floyd and the subsequent guilty verdict and the Chauvin trial can help spur that further. Um, the 
uh, protests over this last year have been incredible around the world. And I hope this moment isn't lost, that out of this tragedy, uh, something very meaningful can happen. Because uh, when you talk from people from all over the political spectrum and throughout the criminal justice system, they agree that there are problems here and they need to change and we can't continue to let things go on. So thank you all for being with us today. Um, I, I hope uh, I'll see many of you in the real world at some point and we can continue to talk about these issues and uh, feel free, especially my students to reach out if you have further questions about this uh, or take criminal procedure from Professor Phillips or I. So uh, we talk about these issues, starting with driving while black to how it fits under Tennessee Garner and the constitutional framework. Uh, so thank you all. I, I hope you found this educational um, and informative.